Thank you. Precious dears, precious dears, uh, you that may be visiting, I understand there are a few visitors here, and uh, you that have been here with me for a little while, I, I say it like it is, and I say it as I see it. I would not be a good doctor if I examine you and discover there's a cancerous growth in you and just give you Pepto-Bismol, tell you all you have is gas. Tylenol for the pain, anesthetize your pain, and send you on your merry way. You're dying. The least I can do is carefully get up to it and tell you what you have has normally been untreatable. Or there is hope and we're going to try this in a little. But to tell you nothing. I'm not being fair. I'm derelict in my duty as a pastor. How many of y'all saw Come Sunday? Now, for you that don't know what it is, don't be glad about it because I want, I want to tell you some things. Number one, that is not the way that thing happened. Maurice was there. At, didn't you go to the hospital in, in Washington? You were there? First of all, several things about the movie I want to say. It's on Netflix. It's called Come Sunday. First thing, the first thing. Dr. Lafayette, I did not call that boy. I never called him. So that's the first lie he put in there. That I called him and invited him to the college to the Joint College of Bishops. I didn't invite Carlton Pearson to the Joint College of Bishops. He called me. He called two or three times. Sister Teresa Hatton answered the phone. I asked Teresa Hatton, find out what he wants. And then he called me again, happened to catch me in that office up there and said he had a revelation from God. I didn't believe that to start with. That's the first part I didn't believe. That it was from God. I believe he had a revelation. He had a nightmare. From God. I don't believe God said anything to him. He called me. And said he wanted at least an opportunity to come to the joint college. And explain himself. I think that you Pentecostals and you Christians, you Christians, right there, tell me he wasn't taking ownership. Say, so you have it wrong. I've been preaching it wrong all these years. And I just want to explain it. I said, all right, you can come. You come on your own dime. Use your own money to come. He came. I turned the microphone over to him in that college of bishops. About 500 bishops were in Mount Calvary Holy Church. 
I let him talk for an hour and a half uninterrupted trying to explain his inclusionism doctrine. Parts of the doctrine. Everybody goes to heaven in the end. Folk that don't believe on Jesus still get to go. He did say it. Now y'all that was there, y'all know he said it. He said they go. Butchers, murderers. Somebody hollered out, well, what about Edi Amen? He said he's going. At that time, Edi Amen was cutting grass in France. He was a gardener in France. He lost his position in Africa. But when he said God himself is going to have to apologize to Satan, I'll never forget it. A shiver went over all of us. And my traveling partner there, and so he, he, he going to have to apologize to Satan and all the folk you say is going to hell won't go because there is no hell. And I said under my breath to myself, won't you be surprised on that great getting up morning when you don't hear the alarm clock? We let him talk an hour and a half and then I turned to lose five bishops to answer him. Uh, the man from Indiana just preached here the other month. Tavis Grant. Bishop Tavis Lane Grant was the first one. Took his doctrine apart piece by piece and went to his seat and sat down and I don't remember the exact order of the rest of them. Bishop Clifford Frazier. Bishop Donald Hilliard. That's three. Got one more I can't remember right in there. No, that's the last one. There's one more right in there before Everett. But when old man Everett got up, he got up and said, Brother Pearson... I believe in inclusionism. And then he told Pearson how to be included with God. <laughs> Bishop Everett, James Everett from New Jersey, turned the place out. I had given instruction that nobody clap, nobody get happy, nobody holler. Glory, yeah, all right, or, or boo, or none of that, not a sound. But whenever it got up and got started, you couldn't contain the house. They come and just shouting and going on. It was a mess in there. And I stood Brother Pearson up and dismissed him. If you saw that movie, he didn't ask me any questions. He didn't ask me anything about my father. What he did was he got my book from ghetto to glory and he read my story about my life and then he made up his own movie he never asked me a thing that day he wasn't allowed to I said you're here to defend yourself explain your mess and that's it and when he finished I said thank you for all that you've said are you ready to repent and recant any of it? Not one word I said then. We are at liberty to call you a heretic. You are a heretic. You're an enemy of God. And in hell you will lift up your eyes if you don't repent before death comes. Now your excuse, you may leave this assembly. He went out the back door, down the steps, put him in my car, and sent him to the airport. 
and haven't talked to him from that day to this. So the movie is just theater. He just needed to make some money. He can't keep a church. Don't be gullible. Don't fall for... And his theme was not love. In that movie, he talked about the love of God. No, he didn't. He denigrated everything we believe in Holy Scripture and said there was no need to turn to Jesus for salvation. That's false doctrine. The Bible told me to tell you these things so that you're not caught up in foolishness and believe everything. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they be of God. And how do you try the spirit? You don't try the spirit by the spirit. There's no such Bible. People say, try the spirit by the spirit. That's not Bible. It's not in the Bible. Try the spirit by what? The word. That's why I'm a little wary of folk always hearing from God. The Lord talked to me last night. You know, I ain't never known God to be such a blabbermouth until I got in holiness. God talked one time. He talked in his word. He said what he had to say. And anything anybody says that doesn't square with the word of God, it's a lie and it's false. And if an angel comes from heaven and preach anything other than what I'm preaching here even now, the Bible said let him be accursed. Curse out an angel. Now, I know he going hear that I said all this and they're going on going on the what is that that we on we Facebook live my wife is in uh, in Dallas and sh she's nervous right now walking up and down in her mother's house she's watching she's watching me I love you baby <laughs> I ain't got nothing but good to say about you <laughs> hallelujah I want Pearson to be saved. Let me explain something. I believe that Donald Trump can be saved. But he's got to turn to Jesus. He's got to surrender all. He's got to believe on him as the scripture said. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Y'all paying me any mind? Yeah. Ain't no need, no need in us playing with this. Either we believe what we say we believe or we don't believe this. But there are many ways, to, many ways to, to New York. I said that's going to New York. I can go 80 to New York or 76 over the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Take 90, go to New York, but ain't but one way to God. Ain't but one way, just one. Somebody holler one. And if you want to know, you want to know what that highway is, you want to know what the way is, Jesus said, I am the way. I, I, I'm the truth. Quit playing, quit playing. Quit playing around with this thing. Either we believe it or we don't. Either it's so or it's not. Hallelujah. So ain't no need, ain't no need me apologizing. I ain't apologizing for nothing I said. And I didn't say much that day. But I'm saying it now. 
If you don't repent, if you don't turn from your wicked way, if you don't turn to Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Calvary, in hell you'll lift up your eye. Hallelujah. But if you will turn, he won't put you on probation. He won't drag you around. He won't tease you. He'll come in and save you. He'll abide with you. Hallelujah. All right. I, I, I knew I was going to do this. I knew I was going to do it. But, but, this, but this just settles it. Hallelujah. I'm not doubting about the way. I'm walking in the light. Holiness is right. I'm not doubting about this way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, that's sermon number one. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. That's it. You can't play with it. You can't play with people about this. You hear me, Sheila? You can't play with it. It's got to be this way or no way at all. Hallelujah. 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 I'm not trying to denigrate anybody's religion. I'm not trying to denigrate anybody's religion. You go on and have your religion. Your religion to carry you nowhere. You got an eternal God to face. And he ain't playing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You've got to do it this way. You've got to come to Jesus. Can't just jump over Jesus and go to God. Because when you get to Jesus, you're at God. You've got to deal with him. He's the only God I know. And he's the only God I know that had the nerve to die. Make up his own body and then die. Thank you, Jesus. And then get himself back up. Nobody ever died and got themselves up but Jesus. Tell us that way. What, we, what we've known about him, what I've known about him, I have a lot of friends who are close to him. I, I didn't call him. I wouldn't have even thought to call him. He's not one of my close friends, never has been. Uh, but he's been a respected clergy. I've never just been close to him. I don't even know the name of his organization. We've used it. I never can think of it. I know it's Pentecostal something, but uh, black or African American uh, thing. But I um, and I have a lot of friends involved in that. I just I'm not want, want never been involved in it. But he's brought pageantry and a lot of beauty uh, and protocol and uh, elegance to Pentecost when it comes to. Uh, um, <sighs> ecclesiastical standards and the Episcopal standards based a lot on on the Vatican standards of the Roman Catholic Church he's been there with a group of men uh, sometimes he's just a crotchety old man <laughs> he's angry and hurt and uh, and I know many many men like that and uh, but I like him he's ours we love him he's ex just like we portrayed him in the movie um, we always used to make fun of him somebody said they say hi Bishop Ellis how you do sanctified <laughs> that uh, I grew up around that kind of uh, stern uh, it, it was a little bit um, playing a role but he probably saw somebody do that when he was younger I don't know how old he is um, but he's done a lot of things he's been involved I understand in the nation of Islam or some aspect of, uh, of um, Islam uh, Church of God in Christ uh, Pentecostal symbols of the world his own independent movements and he moves around has touched a lot of lives and I know there'll be a lot of wonderful things said about him when one day he's eulogized but I didn't call him I don't know where he got that from and I certainly would have called him three times he called me he said you owe it to the body of Christ to come and explain 
let us know what that mess you're talking about. And he would, that, he's candid like that. He would tell you he don't like it. And he don't like a lot of people. <laughs> so he just does it. I, um, but he did say to me, not in the setting, the, when that happened in Washington, those of it, that happened at the, at the former um, Evangel Temple built and founded by the late great Bishop John Mears, who was at my consecration for the bishopric. I met him in 1975. I've been a friend of his sons, Donnie and Virgil, um, as ministers for since I met him. And I preached some of my most successful revivals in that church. And to be there that day in that setting with pretty much of a hostile environment was, was foreign to me. I had only been in that church one other time since the bishop sold it to um, the Owen, to Alfred Owens, and that was during the the, um, the their convocation. Shirley Caesar and her husband, the bishop, was there. She sang. I preached. the The preacher that was very uh, uh, Owens was very kind to me. He wasn't when I came back, but he was the first time I went there. A lot of people were kind to me and respectful. One of the things that I've learned is that church folk can be really mean when they're mad and they they can cut you off and cut you up and cut you out um, that's sad about christianity it's sad about the so-called body of christ um, there are bishops and sons of bishops all through the work <laughs> there's all kind of attitudes there's all kind of uh buffoonery there's all kinds of bullying and arrogance and insecurities and spiritual immaturity your title doesn't mean you're spiritually mature. Your title doesn't mean you have any scholarly background. Your title doesn't mean that you're well learned, uh, though it might indicate same. But beauty is as beauty does. That's what I used to hear Bishop J.A. Blake, who 47 years ago licensed me. And uh, Bishop J.A. Blake is the father of our present presiding Bishop Charles Edwards Blake of the Church of God in Christ. I grew up in their ministry, in that family, pretty much. I used to spend the night in Bishop J.A. Blake's home. He taught me how to go deep sea fishing. I used to mow his lawn because my high, junior high school was down the block. Nana, Nana, we called him, Mother Blake would cook for us. I'm, I, Kojic is all I'll ever uh, be, but an expansion of it. I, I'm four generations classical Pentecostal. I mean, I'm into new thought, science of mind, universalism, I, I, I'm transcendentalism, some aspects perhaps of Zen Buddhism. I love all those things, but I still speak in tongues. I love the Holy Ghost, how I quicken. I know how to pray. I know how to preach and I know how to cast the devil out. Some of the vitriol that's coming from fundamentalists, uh, people that I lived with all my life, and some of you are making comments on, on the line the whole time I'm talking. When you get that upset, it reminds me of the days when I was casting out devils and I've been casting out devils since I was 16 years old. And even though I'm new thought and I'm involved in universalism, which the first 500 years of Christian history, the church fathers were all universalists. They all believed in the finished work of the cross. That when Jesus said it is finished, the word is tetelestai in Greek, it means mission accomplished. Battle done. We're not talking about um, uh, mission impossible, Tom Cruise. We're talking about mission possible, Jesus. The, 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 the gospel, which, which means good news, Evangelion, you is good, angel or messenger uh, is good. The good news is that the bad news is all wrong. But some people, I remember Jesse Dixon saying to me, so Bishop, uh, to some people, the, the gospel is really, the, the good news is just too good for some to believe. You call yourselves a believer and, and Jesus said it is finished and y'all said, oh no, oh no, hell no, it ain't done till we say it's done. It ain't done till you get baptized in the name I want you baptized, whether it's Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or in Jesus, or the Father, Son, Holy, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. We argue about stuff like that. Stupid. But, um, well, protocol. And with the canon, some of you don't even know what canon means. You don't even know what the word Bible means. And I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but I, it's time for us to stop putting up with buffoonery. Y'all let these people act like fools and call themselves leaders and you worship them and follow them. It's like all these people following Trump who call themselves believers and family values and he doesn't represent anything about Christ. So uh, yes, I said it. And sometimes uh, a silent church is a saltless church. We need leadership, strong, decisive, forceful leadership. Uh, and that's not arrogance and it's not dictatorialism. It's somebody that really cares. Shepherding, sheep herding, pastor, 
stargazers. A little, star, a little astrology, and that's where the term in English comes from. The sheep herders are out in the pastures looking at the stars for hours and hours on end. That's why we worship on Sunday and then Moon Day or Monday. Uh, most of the names of the calendar of the week are Greek gods and goddesses. People don't know that. There's not a lot of learning out there. Now, Oral Roberts, my beloved mentor and sometimes tormentor, whose um, disciple and student, I was for 40 plus years, um, we had a close, I had a close proximity to him, his ministry, his mind, his, um, his makeup, his statements that, uh, that um, I've remembered all my life. I think I was sent there by destiny to study the man and to study under the man, to be taught by the man. I loved him to his grave. He and I never broke fellowship. We never stopped being friends. I would go to his house every time I was in Southern California. We'd eat together, we'd go for a ride together, we prayed, we spent hours discuss discussing scriptures. I remember the time and he was quite tired and old and I asked him had he seen Juanita Bynum on TVN. I was proud that when more black people began to be on TVN. And he says, I don't even watch Christian television. I said, excuse me, sir, you invented it. <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not hearing anything. Well, he was disgusted with a lot of things. Same conversation I had with Billy Graham when he said, I don't know that 50 years of evangelism has changed this world at all. I'm 65 years old, though the bishop referred to me as a boy. And I started to say, you must have said, boy, Leroy or ships of Hawk, I know you ain't said boy. No, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. In fact, when you get 65, boy sounds good. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I, and he's the kind of man, again, getting back to, to Bishop Ellis, that people kind of look up to him fatherly. I did too, uh, just out of the normal protocol. And we, we, we celebrate and, and, uh, and um, allow the elders to be elderly. He likes that, that's the way he lives. And we needed that character because that's what it was. Here's what he said to me in the beautiful, just before we went up on the platform uh, in this place, uh, in, in, in uh, I don't know, what, I don't remember the name of the church now, but it was Evangel Temple then. Now it's Evangel Cathedral and Donnie, has, Donnie Mears has it up in Camp Springs, Maryland. Um, he said to me in these words, my daddy been in hell. He just confronted me like that. Now it wasn't exactly the way it came off in the movie because my writers were not comfortable. They did research, they read his books. I've never read his book, I didn't even know he had any books, but he, they read it to make sure the things he said about his father were categorically correct and accurate. But he said to me, my daddy been in hell. I said, oh, how, how do you know he's in hell? Because he died butt naked laying on top of a woman with a gun in each hand. That's what he said. And I thought, wow, he had a heart attack right, or whatever. He did. Well, how long has he been dead? And he said about 15 years. And, and I said, well, do you think he's learned his lesson? Weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, been in hell for 15 years. I don't know, did you, did you love him? I adored him. Did you, did you forgive him? I forgave him then. These are the answers. He, he would answer me like that. And, um, I, and then I asked him if he could get him out of hell, would he? I was very curious. I was still searching. This thing was new to me. And uh, I didn't know it was going to be a, a, a sort of an ambush. I, I thought he honestly wanted me to explain my position theologically, philosophically, to my peers. I went with respect against the advice of my staff. Um, I just didn't. It never crossed my mind that what happened would have happened. Then you didn't see this part when they finished. Uh, they had already made up their mind before I got there. He had, and I think the, those who were who gave the rebuttal. I don't remember who, who all they were, except for I think Donald Hilliard, whom I'd known for years before he had this beautiful cathedral. A brilliant thinker. Um, it it broke my heart that so many people were so quickly quick to drop a friend, a brother. You know, even if I had fallen in a sin, of course, heresy for most of all, I think they would have received me better if I had have been having an affair, an adulterous affair or a fornication affair. If they found me um, embezzling money or I think I would have been treated a little kinder. But when I became a quote unquote universalist and said everybody is included and enclosed in the caring love and mercy that endures forever, of course, that's a 
con a specific contradiction to eternal doom or condemnation or damnation. Uh, they one would cancel out the other, but most people are not that reasonable. We just want to accept hell. Uh, <clears throat> people say uh, many saints walk up to me and say, "Well, Bishop, are you telling me if um, uh, that I can just do anything I want to do and go to heaven?" I say, "Well, let's let's first talk about what you want to do, sweetheart or brother. Who do you want to do? What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Who do you want to do it with? What are you thinking?" Y'all are quick to throw Jesus away. Without, we don't need, without hell, we don't need Jesus. So all Jesus is for you is a fire escape. You don't like his teachings. You don't like his love. You don't like his forgiveness. Uh, you don't like his deliverance ministry. You only need him to get you out of hell. That's the only way you cannot even imagine a kind, loving, revolutionist, metaphysician like Jesus, uh, the one in the Bible, um, unless he can get you something, give something to you, or get something from you, That's, that shows you where your minds are. Would you really love God and serve God uh, if uh, he didn't threaten you for otherwise? If somebody says, I love you and you better believe it, and if you don't believe it, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to torture you forever, and my name is God, and the only way you can get free from my wrath is Jesus. Well, do we need Jesus to protect us from God? Are he and the accuser of the brethren called the deceiver in cahoots? And Jesus protects us from both of them? A lot of this stuff is nonsense. A lot of this stuff is just stupid. And I know it's sacred. My mother's here, my dad, my family. We all have loved this. I preached it with the best and rest of it. Then I had an awakening. You still sleep, that's fine. The alarm is going off and you just keep pushing the snooze button. <laughs> you don't want to wake up. You don't want to get up. Some of you have awakened. You know that what you're teaching is inaccurate. You feel that it's wrong, but you believe it's right. You know it's wrong. I went through that for years. I knew that stuff wasn't accurate. I knew it was inconsistent with the moral character of a loving God whose mercy endures forever. But I didn't believe it. Because my mom and them, and they mom and them. I mean, tradition, we're dealing with at least 2,000 years of entrenched indoctrination. I've done the research. I spent years studying, not just my years in college when I majored in biblical literature, English Bible, and minored in theology and historical studies. I actually studied more after I got out of school. I was, I've always loved the scriptures. I still do. I take them seriously. I just don't take a lot of it literally. The Bible itself says the letter or literal rule, lest the literal kills. Spirit gives life. I believe in the Bible. The Bible says, most of y'all talking, listen, I grew up around you, so I know how you think. You don't even know what the word Bible means. I didn't. We don't know where it came from. It's the word of God. How you know? Because it says it is. <laughs> well, uh, who told you that? Why, will you, why do you believe that? Those who read the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita? Or other sacred writings believe theirs is also the word of God. There's been at least eight or nine other Christ-like figures in human history that predates Jesus by thousands of years who were born supposedly of a virgin mother and had 12 disciples and was a healer and a teacher and a reformist and, and a man of peace and he loved the folk and was executed and is supposed to come back and hasn't yet. I've been to Jerusalem. There are two different places where the resurrected Christ was supposed to have been buried, and both of them are empty. The garden tomb, which most Protestants believe is the accurate place, and the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the Roman place. Uh, Roman Catholic is beautiful, and well, it's all really dusty and, and cluttery, but it's sacred. I cried in both places, more at the garden tomb, because it seemed more like a, a garden tomb. And both of them were empty, and both of them are being claimed to have been the, the place where the resurrected Christ is because we can't find his body. You can't find his body in any of those places. What's that supposed to mean? That he's not buried somebody else? I'm not suggesting that he is, but even if he was, that wouldn't break my faith. I still trust the divinity that I feel, that I am, that I believe in. I don't need religion. I can use it, maybe. I like the connectedness. I like the sociology of it. But institutional organized religion is a dangerous thing. It is tribalism, territorialism, elitism, a lot of bigotry, self-righteousness, 
Many African Americans are upset about the white supremacists. There are not as many of them, and the people who call themselves white supremacists really have very low self-image and are very insecure. But it's the white superiority, which we blacks have bought into when we call ourselves Christian, because we're all the chosen people, which means the rest of the world goes to hell. God only likes a few of us. The righteous shall scarcely make it in. Where shall the ungodly appear? The righteous shall scarcely, barely, almost not make it in. That's what that's in our subconscious. And we, we're literalists. I'm not, I, I'm not a literalist. Anybody who tells you that the Bible is inerrant and infallible has not read it through. Hasn't studied the language. Haven't studied or done the etymology of the words. We're talking about five major languages and many others. We don't even know where the original handwritten copies are. As far as we know, they don't exist. All we have are copies of copies of God. Let the Bible say this. And the Bible said, that. study the history of the Bible. Study to show your, the Bible also says, study to show yourself approved. A work that needs not be ashamed. Rightly, accurately, right or upright, correctly, erectly, accurately, dividing, distinguishing, discerning the word of truth, the logos, the logic of truth. Most of the time you see the word of God is the Greek word logos, where we get the word logic or logistics. There is a divine logistic in the universe. You can call it also the laws of the universe, which include the laws of attraction, which include the laws of sowing and reaping. What's wrong with intelligence? What's wrong with research? What's wrong with admitting after 50 years of walking a certain way, I had to admit, I think I got this wrong. In my, in my traditional uh, uh, colloquial Pentecostal language, I believe the Holy Ghost said to me one day, do you really believe what you're preaching? Yes. How do you know it's correct? Well, it's in the Bible. What do you mean by Bible? Your word. Whose word? Who knows my word? That's my word? All of y'all say that's my word. I don't even need words. <laughs> you just don't understand me without me talking to you. Do you think that the serpents who spoke to Eve and Adam uh, spoke in Hebrew? Do you think that, um, that God speaks Hebrew? Well, if he speaks Hebrew, he speaks Japanese and Chinese, and if he's omnipresent, meaning everywhere, omniscient, omniscient, all-knowing, science means knowledge, uh, omnipotent, all the potential of power in the universe or anywhere is God. That same omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God admitted in the sixth chapter of Genesis that he made an error. He made a mistake. Oh my, what have I done? The word repent means to sigh ruefully in Hebrew. He went, oh, this ain't gonna work. I repent, I regret that I made these folks. They're human, they're mortals. I ain't down with this. <laughs> I don't like this earth project. In the subconscious mind of many people, they know that God is upset and God is angry and God is jealous and God is discontented and God is insecure and God is paranoid and he's making a list and checking it. Out. So the gospel of inclusion, and there's a book that I wrote for all of you that have questions and I know there are many of them. I'm just trying to make things a little clearer. Um, it's okay to rethink. That's what the word repent means, metanoia, to change the mind or to reconsider. Literally, after you have thought, think again. Now, I've questioned and questioned and questioned. I ask the questions, I answer the questions, then I question my answers. This is a book called uh, The Gospel of Inclusion, Reaching Beyond Religious Fundamentalism to the True Love of God and Self. I just realized after 50 years, and I, when my consciousness expanded, that I was going from self-loathing to self-loving. Let me say something again about our beloved Bishop Ellis. He talks about the, the rocky, painful relationship that he had with his father. I have a lot of sympathy for him. I don't have empathy because my relationship with my father was marvelous. My dad was not abusive in any way, verbally, attitudinally, certainly not physically or sexually. Uh, I don't know how I would have handled that. I don't think the man's been healed. He's considerably older than I am, but you feel that pain, that anger, 
that resists.